Um, today we're going to be talking about the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning, which is, among other things, a high throughput production house and broadcast archives. Our profile as a repository most closely matches a broadcast center like a television station because we do a lot of our own video production. And our challenges as a production archives are similar to a broadcaster. Um, our chief patrons are producers, people who are producing and reusing content. We have to do things very quickly. We have to turn around video collections very quickly in support of events on campus and courses for the campus. We're constantly dealing with changing capture technology. In the earliest days, we were shooting mini DV, and now we're shooting 4K to solid state SD cards. And in my time here as the archivist, I've been here for about seven years now. And we have looked through all kinds of technologies for uh, media asset management, things that will work at our scale but don't cost as much as like the big broadcast um, companies like uh, in the United States, NBC or other television broadcasters. And we really haven't found much that works for us that allows us to store our data locally, not in the cloud because the file sizes are so big for transfer and allows us to deal with all the different kinds of file types that we have. Um, as you can see here, this is a, a, a one semester course. Um, it's not just time based media that we're dealing with. Of course, we're dealing with a lot of um, things like PowerPoint slides for um, course presentations and event presentations and um, other kinds of documents as well. So the heterogeneity of the file types is something we have to deal with as well. We also have some legacy materials up in the upper left there, the aforementioned mini DV and a little bit of analog stuff that we have to digitize as well. So how do we deal with all of this stuff? Knowing that nothing, there's no all in one solution that we could afford. That's why we've been developing what we call CA or the curricular, curricular asset warehouse. Where the purposes of CA are to process and serve our production materials to our producers also to make things findable, of course. So there's the repository side, um, and also to generate what we call import wizards that allow our users, chiefly our producers, to tag objects as they ingest them off of the SD cards so that most of that is time-based media. And we also have to comply with different kinds of American laws like um, FERPA and the TEACH Act, which both um, put limits on how we can make um, course room materials and things like class rosters available um, and also copyright law. So we have to have something that knows what we've produced and, and in what context we've produced. We have three kind of domains that cost straddles. There's the production world. So workflows from camera to edits and beyond. There's also the archival side. That's my domain that is finding old stuff and adhering to our role as a land grant state university. So we have a legal um, in, encumbrance to preserve things long term. And also dealing with pedagogy, dealing with instructors who are our chief clients. We are mostly making stuff for classes and events related to instruction. So you can see here there's a basic workflow of production. And then we use different kinds of tools like Box and a tagging tool called Frame.io for our producers to collaborate with each other and with the instructors who are our clients. And then the archive staff that generates metadata and um, encourages the findability of our stuff. And um, when we write it off to tape, tells us where we um, are storing the data long term so that we can retrieve things and reuse them very, very quickly. So here's a guide to how things flow from left to right, from um, SD card through file servers, spinning disks where the producers are collaborating. We use spinning disk technology there because we have to move data very quickly and collaborate. Many people have to be acting on a project together through streaming where we um, put edits and um, stringer edits for 
our clients to review so we can communicate with them through the cost system, creating metadata records, transcoding things as necessary, and um, uh, packaging up collections for being written off to LTO tape, which is kind of where I live. The guiding principles of the curricular asset warehouse include, we really want to use open software and specifications wherever possible. Um, we don't want any kind of patent encumbrances. It's ideally, we don't want to have to pay for updates with one caveat that is Adobe Premiere um, and some other Adobe um, Creative Cloud um, tools that we have to pay rental on basically every month. Um, everything is very production forward. Our, again, our chief um, uh, mandate is to serve production. Catalog records are a consequence of ingest. We have a tool called SD ingest that allows us to make records um, when the, the objects are written off of the SD card. We get XML files that are pushed up uh, the PD core compliant files that get pushed up into our cataloging system. We don't like using the cloud. We want our data to stay local because we have to be able to access it very quickly. And it's just too time consuming to move gigabytes of data up and down that way. And we want to always support the discovery and stewardship and reuse of our old content. It saves time. It saves resources to not have to shoot things over and over again. And we have to allow for rights management and levels of access based on those aforementioned laws, the TEACH Act, FERPA, and copyright. So again, nothing really worked for us to do all of this. We looked at things like Collective Access, DSpace, and Preservica. We also looked at some production tools like Axel AI and Kino that are used um, in uh, kind of large broadcast settings. We do use Kino for marking up objects as they're being worked on. Um, but ultimately, none of these tools did everything we wanted to do, hence the CAW system, which also works as a cataloging tool, again, using PV core um, metadata and um, creating different kinds of record types. So we've got collection level records and asset level records. At the time of SD ingest, um, the SD ingest tool creates asset level records for every object that's on the card. And as you can no doubt guess, there's thousands of objects and collections. It's just too much for any human to create records for. So SD ingest makes asset records for every object, but then also makes a collection level record that our producers and the archival team can add um, some provenance metadata and descriptive metadata to content metadata, where we use media info to create the asset records with all of the technical metadata. The collection level records tie it all together using these tools. Um, many of these tools are a little bit opaque to me, your humble archivist. Uh, I know media info and Adobe Premiere, but some of these other ones I'm not as, as familiar with. If you have questions about these, please email me and I can put you in contact with Liam, who's our IT genius, who's building the cost system. And um, another kind of aspirational thing that we are working on with CA is the ability to act on Adobe Premiere projects en masse. So even things that have already been edited, in some cases years ago, if we ever want to um, in, in a large way, make changes. Like if the Illinois branding um, dot and bug and uh, opening and closing of our videos changes for some reason, Illinois decides to have a very different indicia or identity. We can use the CAW to go through, find all of the places where the files are for these things and change them all together, either on our spinning disks or on our LTO tapes in order to um, say what we call monkey work, which is kind of the, the dumb work that you don't want people to have to bother doing. Um, you want the cost system to do all of that for you. So that's kind of the big kind of next vision for CAW. So that's the curricular asset warehouse. And now I'm going to turn this over to Karen Hodgen-Jones, who's going to talk about her sustainability research with CITL. 
So a lot of the tools and resources and processes that Dr. Jones just went through are things that occur also in my teaching space um, and are um, issues that have come up through courses that I've taught where we're investigating e-waste and sustainability of digital art production. Um, and so the case study analysis of CA is directly related to in the continuation of that research. So looking at CA um, as a case study, I'm looking at the kind of traditional three pillars of sustainability, environmental um, impacts, economic benefit, and social equity. And in terms of those three, um, the decreased energy use, reused materials, extended device life cycles that CAW manages to achieve um, are, are within uh, the benefits of environmental impact. Economically, the cost to manage this resilient system with maximum economic efficiencies gained by environmentally beneficial conditions are um, really related to need, that it is because of costs that these things are happening, um, but choices like cold storage and the cost effectiveness of that also have great environmental benefit. Um, and then of course, equity, um, as Dr. Jones pointed out, PAW is meant to be open and available and teachable. And so the fact that it is geared toward learners of all levels increases the um, ability of, of access to call resources and knowledge. Excuse me. Some of the drivers of sustainability, um, as I mentioned before, cost and project management concerns really led to a lot of the innovation and looking at the history and speaking with the team about the history of choices and the kind of decision trees that went to uh, went into where they are now in terms of devices, software, and workflows. Um, the subscription software model for Adobe Premiere in particular led to a change where the entire team is now using Windows machines and no longer using Apple products um, because they found a number of difficulties maintaining version control um, in Apple's machines and system specifications um, consistency that they were able to, to control through Windows machines instead. Um, part of that also comes from the use of the University of Illinois surplus inventory system. Um, I'll go into how the inventory system works a little more in, in detail later, um, but the, the process of being able to access reusable durable goods from the large scale inventory of the institution, let's call it reuse higher end computers without additional cost to them without having to make purchases. Um, so this has multiple economic as well as environmental benefits. Um, the team went through a long process of testing the efficiency of different systems. Um, and initially, you know, the goal would have been to have very quick render times and kind of uh, personnel efficiencies. And so they were using gaming graphic cards, but those systems required 500 watt power supplies. And this was a huge increase in energy costs over kind of more conventional Windows, uh, Windows machines. So they tested out Windows machines um, with QuadroLine graphics cards instead, and they had the standard kind of power supplies and energy consumption. And there was a dramatic redu reduction in energy consumption and the cost to run that equipment. Um, also the ability and cost to replace and maintain towers and peripherals was much, much lower because there weren't specialized components. Um, and they discovered pretty quickly the quadrilline cards actually had very comparable render speeds to the gaming cards. So there wasn't a benefit in cost, in actual energy, either energy cost or energy use, um, or in the efficiency of the team in making that change. So they reverted to a much more, uh, a simpler, more reproducible system. The Adobe CC subscription software, this caused this team-wide shift in the way that hardware and software was employed. They switched to only Windows machines um, and because they had to reassess how software version control occurs with the subscription model. Um, the subscription model first really revealed the challenges by making After Effects um, one of the Creative Cloud um, graphics and motion graphics editing tools, um, after the post-production for video tool, um, it really made it unworkable for them. After several updates to the subscription, um, they'd been using this to create various types of motion graphics and other graphics. It was clear that unfinished projects, if they wanted to keep an open project file, available that may be the method by which they would put the black eye that you can see in the top right hand corner of this um, of this card. If they wanted to add this graphic to a video, after only six months to a year, that that uh, 
open project file would no longer be compatible with newer versions of, um, of Adobe After Effects. And so this led to a realization that this was not actually a, a tool that was going to work for them. Um, they transitioned to other software, uh, but they were still wanting to use, because of all the benefits that Dr. Jones listed, Adobe Premiere. So they continued working with Adobe Creative Cloud, continued to have the licenses, um, and they had an interesting, uh, interesting event that happened that is probably quite near to some of the concerns of those of you who are archivists. Because they were a service archive, they did have to dedicate one older machine, freeze it in time with an operating system and a version of After Effects that had been used by a class on campus that was still using that particular version for a class demo, um, which again, this really demonstrates how challenging with a subscription software model it can be to uh, maintain older versions that are that are updated monthly or sometimes weekly, um, depending on bug fixes, to really hold something as a point in time so that unfinished projects um, by artists or archives who want to manage those, who want to demo those, um, it's really difficult to get back to any of those earlier versions um, that would be able to open and host those unfinished project files. There's a really interesting finding in caught that that was one of the big drivers to not just transition away from After Effects as a software tool, but specifically to use Windows machines because of the operating system and uh, subscription software push and pull that was occurring. So the University of Illinois um, has a purchasing and inventory system, and it requires all durable equipment purchased by campus entities to move into a state surplus, university or state surplus system to be available for reuse. So computers, servers, modular components can be reused without additional purchase costs to call. Um, they just transition the inventory onto their budget. So units can reuse equipment internally, transfer inventory between departments, um, and this is great because there are a lot of very high-end supercomputing um, facilities on campus, and this very high-end research, sophisticated research ma material can be used by other units for years. Most of the COD production team are, are currently using two to three-year-old computers, and they all are kept in identical um, system specifications. And then the team overall, uh, beyond the production team, maintains tiers of reuse. And many team members are currently using eight-year-old devices, which is extending the life um, cycle ex expectation of a Windows machine to the edge of what is usually the life cycle or about three years be beyond. Five to eight years is, is kind of the maximum for usually how long these devices last. In every possible way, this alone improves upon any linear uh, device lifecycle where you would go from extraction, manufacture, purchase, and use, and landfill, um, or possibly recycling in a very, very closed loop or a very straight line in this case. So because of the uh, single inventory, there's a different kind of recycling structure than one of the favored recycling structures. Um, an essential sustainability practice is to bind manufacturers to the waste that their products produce or become. And this is useful because it, it compels manufacturers to design for recoverability of materials, for remanufacture or refurbishment. Design to dismantle is actually supported by extended extended producer responsibility, which is the model on the right. The manufacturer manufactures, we purchase and use it, it is returned to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer is responsible for the recycling. Then that goes back into um, manufacture and closes the loop. <clears throat> the UIUC inventory surplus system, however, can't use EPR model because we can't return each individual device to the manufacturer. So instead, um, it's using a different, a different structure of contract recycling. Um, and while extended producer responsibility is a very popular uh, policy mechanism to reduce waste, it has some flaws. It continues to need raw, raw material insertion at the remanufacturer or manufacturer stage. And it has a number of unmanaged externalities. Um, often devices are retired well before their mechanical functionality is, is actually done. Um, and externalities such as older devices um, that are not manufactured by that particular manufacturer but are in that kind of electronic waste stream aren't necessarily accepted by those recyclers. Um, 
But with institutional scale contracts recycling, you can actually move a lot more legacy non-reusable equipment into recycling or at least divert from landfill after extended reuse. And having these much longer loops where we're extending the life of products by three to five years is, is a huge benefit, decreases overall demand um, and decreases uh, what the net effects are of the environmental impact. And again, CAW is extending their loops to eight plus years in every way they can. So environmental benefits are driven by cost, access to cheap modular components, allowed teams, uh, the team to use devices longer. They employ a remanufacturer sustainability practice for devices and servers that can be repaired or reconstructed to suit team needs. The devices are all kept on the same OS and Adobe CC version, and they slow walk those updates to maintain compatibility for active project files. The hot to cold production to archive, um, archival storage system also creates a really su substantial environmental benefit. Um, it only employs servers for active files and LTO tape is for completed projects. So in the initial, initial investigation of CAW, it showed that building out spinning disk uh, capacity for the infrequently accessed project files, it was substantially more energy intense and cost substantially more than tape. Um, so right now, CAW uses LTO7 and has about 250 terabytes of data in storage. Um, it's about a sixth the cost of keeping that same amount of storage on disk. It has very fast write times. The archivist can easily access and move about a terabyte of data um, back onto spinning disk when needed. Um, the benefits of LTO tapes, it's considered non-toxic waste, and there are a number of extended producer responsibility take-back programs where there's direct reuse, not even reconstructing, but reuse of LTO tapes when they have been used. Um, there's some issues with LTO. Obviously, the drives can fail. It would benefit greatly from more right to repair options so that the drives could run longer. Um, LTO drives are an expense. They're not found in institutional surplus inventory. Um, after LTO 9, uh, it seems they're not maintaining gen multi-generational backward compatibility. Um, and in the case that there was a need to move a substantial amount of uh, data onto a new version in the future, it would require blind handling to handle um, copyright, intellectual property, family education rights, and Privacy Act or FERPA, and the TEACH Act requirements as well. So the need for small, reliable, fast server array, short-term storage during production, and minimal long-term server storage has been a huge economic but also environmental benefit. Um, the frequency of use of the entire array, it makes the uptime very efficient. There's almost no energy wasted. The, the capacity is being used, nothing sitting idle. Um, and the completed production files moving to LTO tape with really rapid um, data access within 24 hours when needed means there's almost no cost to store other than um, maintaining the environment. So initial findings working with CAW have shown the efficiencies were mostly cost um, driven. It could be expanded as a model for greater community benefit, this kind of process of working with uh, the large surplus system has revealed ways that collaboration so that you can create tiered distribution of devices for long-term reuse um, and bring more legacy devices into recycling by contract recycling may be a better option for um, a number of groups than relying on, for example, extended producer responsibility model for recycling of electronic devices. This can encourage pretty short loops, but the surplus model encourages lengthening those loops in possibly many, many years. Um, so again, this potential to form collaboratives that would engage in similar device reuse and cost sharing, this could have a major impact on costs for smaller archives, schools, community organizations, a, a city's um, library system, et cetera, if this model wound up being um, as, as beneficial as it appears to be um, in this initial case study. Thank you so much. There we go. Now, Jimmy, can you hear us? I am here now. Ah, there you are. There you are. Oh, there's <laughs> one question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you're ready for one question, here it comes. Okay. Uh, because in uh, my presentation, I saw very quickly uh, I get this problem with an uh, outdated device that still can't be used. My question is, uh, uh, do you know more uh, 
more things that can press the manufacturer to comply with uh, this and to open uh, their already legacy or um, outdated uh, devices to be used uh, by the community. And I give the following quick example, uh, Avid Capture module, for example, can still can be used because it's working. Uh, mechanically and electrically it's working, but because there is no release at uh, SDK or drivers or something like that, practically it's working, but cannot be uh, used by open source uh, community. So uh, because I see you working hard in this uh, direction, could you say something? How can those people will be pressed, forced to do that? Thank you. Um, I heard a little bit, it sounded like, how do we, how do we press manufacturers to yep. prepare to, to deal with upstate materials? Um, that's a good question. I feel like that's more of a Karen question than a me question. Um, she's on the YouTube chat, and I think there might be a little bit of a lag, so let's see if she's got a response to it. My, my response is, I, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that's a very, very <laughs> honest a answer. Response. Thank you so much, Jim. <laughs> okay, I so let's see if let's see if Karen uh, can weigh yeah. in. Okay, then she will type it in. Sure. Okay, I think we're a bit of out of questions, Jimmy and Karen. I really want to thank you for taking the time, um, and hope to see you next year at IPRES, perhaps. The University of Illinois is hosting that. IPRES will be here. Yes, IPRES will be there. So perhaps we, yes. will, we will all see you there. The first, first round of drinks is on me. Okay. For Great. Up to, up we'll to remember three people. that. Up to three okay. people. First three people. First free <laughs> one. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's a good thing. Thank you so much. I do want to quickly thank you all for making this such an inclusive conference and offering online options for us. That we really That means a lot to us. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Around thank you. Thank you.